This week on CrossFeed. Do Catholics have the right to marry? God in the Hawaii Senate. Churches being taxed. Joel Osteen takes a stand. Illegal religious buildings in India. Hello, everybody. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. Hey, everybody. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, snow capital of the world. Yeah, you guys really got hammered, didn't you? So far, since um, right after Christmas, we have gotten 60 inches of snow. No, no joke, I have four feet of snow out on my um, uh, uh, front front yard. And um, it, that, that, that is here. We're, we're having terrible problems here at the house with ice dams. Everybody are, everybody is because of all, but some people's roofs are caving in because of it. Um, and uh, we've got, um, it's just, it's just, it's a winter like I can't believe, I tell you. It's, I was supposed to get another six to eight inches of snow uh, Groundhog Day. Oh wow! So um, you know, if, if not a foot, you know. So uh, the record snow is 102 inches, um, and 95 in the winter of 95 to 96. So and working. I have a sneak where I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to break it because we're ahead of snow from, with that we were that year. Huh. And it's been so cold; none of it's been melting. I mean, you know, it just keeps piling up, and um, to, you know, to shovel now, everybody, you know, is is learning how to shovel vertically because you, you can't just throw it because you've got to throw it over the mounds of snow that you've already got. So do you have, I mean, do you have cities that are sort of downstream that are going to get flooded when this starts to melt? Oh, or we, we don't know what we're going to do when it starts to melt. <laughs> it's going to, uh, the flooding doesn't take, I don't think we'll have to worry too much about the flooding. It all goes eventually into the Charles River and on out to the bay. Um, so I'm not too worried about that, but, um, it's just, oh, it's, um, but the, these storms, they, they hit the ocean and the cold air and the warm, you know, relatively warmer ocean just causes them to blossom and they just, wait, they, they deepen here and they just give New England everything. Yeah. But, uh, our average snowfall for the year is 41 inches. And so we're already 20 inches over our average. Wow. Yeah, no, that was when I was in Iowa. That was the big thing. You get a fast melt. You know, all of a sudden you get some really warm days after where there's a lot of snow on the ground. And all of a sudden, um, the rivers would just start flooding. And there were, there were times where entire towns would be wiped out, which I always thought, how long did this town last? Cause it's not like this is the worst rain that we've had in, you know, centuries or something, but it was kind of strange, but. There were some pretty bad ones, though. So I I had a really cool night tonight. Um, we were in in our Genesis class. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. And um, were you in favor of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. We talked about why did God destroy these cities? What was their sin that was so bad that that God said that He wanted to wipe them out? And and usually people think of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and we even have the term sodomy, all right? And, and they think that it's all this because of the homosexuality. But if you look at what Ezekiel had to say about it and um, what Jesus said about it in Matthew, it's actually their big sin was a lack of hospitality. I did not know that. We see Abraham invites God and the angels into his tent. Um, Lot invites, you know, the angels say, oh, we're going to sleep in the square. And Lot goes, oh, no, you're not. You're going to stay at my house. All right. And it's all about hospitality. Whereas how do the people of, how do the men of Sodom react? Come out here so we can rape them. Heck of a welcome wagon you got there. Right. And I would say, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that was kind of the final straw. But there was a thing of I've heard of great evil in this city. Uh, so you know, I think I 
I think a an abuse of sexuality was definitely part of it. But it was abuse of many things. If I remember right, Ezekiel also talks about being wealthy and proud and right, and didn't know. care for the poor and needy. That's the the big emphasis. You mean they were all Republicans? <laughs> Yeah, we're not going to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that, that's, you know, Ezekiel, you look at his big emphasis is not, you know, he says that that their attitude led them to practicing abominable acts, right? But that's sort of secondary. That's like, oh, yeah, it eventually led to that. But the great sin that gets emphasized and, and see Jesus refers to it when he says, go into these towns and if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and all that kind of stuff. It's like, if they don't welcome you into their homes, if they don't accept you, all right, what is it? He's talking about hospitality. Cause then he says, it'll be worse for those towns than Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, why would he mention Sodom and Gomorrah when he's not talking about any kind of sexual sin? Because the primary sin which just the way he says it'll be worse than for Sodom and Gomorrah, the fact that he mentions that without sort of any explanation is people understood at that time that the whole Sodom and Gomorrah thing was about what do you do about the um, the aliens and strangers? What do you do about the poor and needy? You know, that it's that whole care for the orphans and widows and care for, you know, care for people in need. That was the big thing. And, and when you look at God and how, how he is with people, how Jesus was um, in his ministry, all right? Yeah, sexual sin's a big deal, all right? But what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah that really, really upset God was that there were people in need that weren't being cared for. Which brings us to Joel Osteen. Yeah. Wasn't that, <laughs> I, I figured we'd transition to that first. Um, <laughs> and speaking of homosexuality as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now that's a bad transition without explanation. <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't think about that. Okay. He was on there with his uh, wife, all right, just for clarification. All right. Okay. So, um, anyhow, he was interviewed by Piers Morgan on CNN. I've never watched him. Um, Piers Morgan and, hasn't been on CNN very long. He used to be on America's Got Talent. Oh. He was one of the judges. Okay, it beats Perez Hilton. Anyway, so uh, um, so anyhow, uh, uh, Joel Olstein and his wife were on there, and uh, so uh, apparently Morgan really kind of hammered him. I mean, he really pressed him for I want you know, uh, you know, clear cut answers on what he really thinks. And um, one of the questions he asked him is, you know, uh, um. You know, po- asking point blank, is homosexuality a sin in your eyes? And Olstein, to, to his credit, said, yes, I've always believed that. Um, the scriptures show it's a sin. But I'm not one of those out there who are going to bash uh, homosexuals and tell them they're terrible people and all that. I mean, there are other sins in the Bible, too. Um, I, I liked his answer. I really liked his answer. Actually, he continues, he says, I think sometimes the church, I don't mean this critically, but we focus on one or issue or two issues, and there's plenty of other ones. Um, so I don't believe homosexuality is God's best for a person's life. I mean, sin means to miss the mark. Well, obviously, he's, you know, kind of read some beginning theology or something there. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's listened to my pastor's class tapes because I, I've, I say that much. So... This is, I was really happy to see this, and I was really happy the way he dealt with it, too. You know, and it's, you know, it's kind of like what we were just talking about, that, that, yeah, this is not what God wants, but God did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah to zap the gays, all right? Um, and, I mean, that's so important to understand, because Osteen's exactly right, that we as, as the church, as far as the, the Christian church in America— have handled this horribly. Um, you know, we, we spend so much time on the political issues and, and stuff like that. And just, you know, you have the, the kind of extreme of, um, of the Westboro Baptist church that has made it the focus of everything they do. Um, but it's just, in general, it's just, it's, it's really been 
we just haven't handled this well. We're in trouble. So, in fact, I asked uh, in um, when we were talking about it in class tonight. I, I said, "All right, so you know, how accepting are we as a church of of people?" Um, you know, that would, how, how would we react if, if somebody came in and, um, off the street, you know, and, and attended our services and, and they were openly gay or, or, or someone said, you know, that may or may not have happened, but what if a couple came in as a couple, you know, how would, how would we react? And, um, and, and the response is, well, you like to think that, we would welcome them. Um, but I don't know how people would react, but I think it's, it's something, you know, that I thought about, I thought this is something that we need to talk about. How do you react when somebody comes in that is, is not, uh, you know, whether it's, they're not living a, a lifestyle that's, uh, uh, um, sort of God pleasing lifestyle. How do you react if, um, you know, just to people that are different from us in whatever way. You know. And um so it just you know, it was it was a, a really important thing. And so I was this is one time that I really had to agree with Osteen. I was really impressed by what he had to say. Title for this one. Dale Critchley, Joel Osteen. They agree. <laughs> All right. Although then uh he also talks about uh, and of course, the whole gay thing. Joel Osteen agree, says homosexuality is sin. You know, the you look at the any of these articles, and you look at their the comments section, and it's yay, way to go, Joel. Tell it like it is. You know, hold up the scriptures. Or, well, Osteen's horrible, and he's promoting violence against homosexuals, or or you know, I mean, all uh, kinds of whatever. ridiculous things. Well, I think he went over. I, I, I Morgan even pushed him. He said he can't. You know, he got real. You know, uh, Elton John and his civil partner David Furnish. You know, do you think they're sinners? And it's directly what Scripture says. Uh, I mean, I can't grab one part and says God wants to be blessed and live an abundant life, and not grab the other part that says, you know what, you know, live that kind of life. I just, you know, it comes back to Scripture. I'm not the judge. You know, God didn't tell me to go around judging anybody, everybody. And I, again, that you know, and I was talking. That our my kids in confirmation about that this week. I said, you know, we, we, we're covering the verse judge not lest you be judged. And we talked about how the fact that, you know, look, we, you know, we have to use the right judgment. The cool, the question is what judges us? And, you know, if, 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 you know, if our standard is scripture, then we just say, look, this is what the Bible says. You know, and I can't tell you anything more. I, I can tell you that the, I'm under the same judgment you are. You know, and, and God has some serious things to say about my sin, just as much as he has some serious things to say about your sin. And maybe my sin's not the same as yours, but that's not, but God doesn't sit back and go, God doesn't sit back and go, oh, well, yours, yours is an okay sin. Right. Yeah. So, um, they, the, Pierce also asked him if he ever felt guilty for his wealth. Um, and he says, I don't ever feel guilty because it comes from, it's God's blessings on my life. And for me to apologize for God's, how can God, or how God has blessed you, it's almost an insult to our God. All right. So talk about, and, and he says that he is not a prosperity gospel preacher, uh, which refers to pastors who say God wants you to be happy, healthy, and rich. And, um, he says that he preaches about finances and said he's not a proponent of that version of Christianity he says I get categorized into this guy that's a prosperity preacher. I don't even believe in that. I mean that's not the focus. The main thing that I'm talking about is how you can excel. I I, I don't know. I've heard I've heard him I say I would say he falls in that even if he denies it. Yeah. Uh, although I thought one thing was kind of interesting. Oh here it is. Um um yeah I and I, I just thought this was a little he was unapologetic about his financial wealth. For the interview, he wore a finely tailored suit and shirt, which Morgan went at great lengths to point out. You know, Osteen said he and his wife have given away millions. I mean, it, is there is that necessary to point that out? Yeah, you, you dress pretty good there. Well, yeah, if okay, I'm I going on national rack, TV, I dress off the rack from Coles. You know. <laughs> yeah, 
I, if I'm going to be on national TV, I want to dress nice. Yeah. Uh, even if it means I have to rent a nice suit. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the senior pastor of the largest church in America. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't I get mean, paid for it. I wouldn't get number, you know, even if he did get paid for it, I wouldn't expect him to get paid, you know, a couple, a couple hundred dollars. But yeah, he, he does say that, you know, his, um, money all comes from his books. Books and DVDs. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't even draw a salary. Okay. You know what? You can't, I'm, I'm sorry, but he's doing really well. <laughs> I mean, as far no. as, and, and plus he gives away the, you know, it says he and his wife given away millions. Mm hmm. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not I, judging. <laughs> right. I mean, I, you know, I mean, should J.K. Rowling give back all her money? I mean, <laughs> you know, she's made, she's done really well with the boy wizard. Um, you know, yeah, but he's he's not a pastor. Yeah, I guess. But he says, you know, he says that, uh, you know, he, he, he sold more than 20 million copies of his book. Well, if you, you know, hey, if you sell 20 million copies of a book and you get a couple million, a couple bucks for each book, that's $40 million. Right. I mean, you know, that's just the way that works. Um, you know, but he's one of the few preachers in the, the world that probably get it, uh, make that kind of money. But, you know, just it, it's, I don't know. I wonder if, you know, Morgan complains about, you know, how, uh, how much a, a baseball player gets. Right. Yeah. So. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say overall, I, w I was pretty impressed with this. Um, I, I think it was, these were good questions to ask. Um, just because they're questions that people ask. All right. And at that point, it gives him a chance to publicly answer these questions instead of people just sort of asking them rhetorically. Mm -hmm. You know, and, no, it is not a sin to be rich, right? It's what you do with it, and 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 even more importantly, it's what does it mean to you? What is what does that money mean to you, right? If it's all about being rich, then you've got an idolatry problem. But if you happen to get rich because you um you published some books and they really became popular, well, you know. Great. You don't have to give it all away. But it's, you know, what are you doing with it and why? And that's between you and God. So, now, hey. One of these days I'll write the book and do it. I don't know. Uh, let's go over and talk about uh, the Alliance Defense Fund, I guess, here. Speaking of money and taxes and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we, we've dealt with this issue before uh, in other times. Uh, uh, Mission, Kansas, which uh, is, oh gosh, was about... Uh, Something draws near. I can feel it. Ten miles, five miles, ten miles from my home growing up. Uh, maybe not even that far. It, uh, uh, my, matter of fact, I worked over in Mission. Um, so I know where Mission is quite well. Um, instituted a driveway tax. I'm not sure exactly what that meant. Um Apparently, it's a utility fee that charges property owners for road work based on how much traffic they generate. I'm not sure how you can do that. Uh, but anyway, so um, uh, uh, um, two churches, First Baptist Church of Mission and Pius, St. Pius the Tenth Catholic Church, have um, appealed the, this fee. Is saying it's a tax. You have no right to tax churches, um, and the Alliance Defense Fund is uh, suing on their behalf. Yeah. Now the big irony here, all right? There's there's two issues. There's just you know the sort of question about this. There's also how the um, Alliance Defense Fund is addressing this, and this is pointed out by uh, the uh, on on the Examiner. Uh, blog website and it's the, the this, this is not to be confused with the Washington Examiner, which is run by Philip Anschutz, a very conservative Christian news well, conservative newspaper with a kind of a Christian emphasis. Uh, this is uh, the Reason Examiner, which is an atheist website. So, got to keep the well, two this is separate. 
this is an examiner that has bloggers from all different perspectives, but this particular blogger on that site is um is, uh, is it's the rationalism examiner. Yeah, it's religion and spirituality sec- secular. Anyway, go ahead. So um the she points out that um she quotes off of the um Alliance Defense Fund's uh website. For decades, the ACLU and other radical anti-Christian groups have been on a mission to eliminate public expression of our nation's faith and heritage by influencing the government, filing lawsuits, and spreading the myth of the so-called separation of church and state. The opposition has been successful at forcing its leftist agenda on Americans. All right, but then the senior legal counsel for the Alliance Defense Fund is quoted saying. It makes no sense to tax churches and to limit their ability to provide their services, and it does damage to the constitutional separation between church and state. All right, so this person is saying, um, whatever happened to separation of church and state is unconstitutional. Now you're saying it is. Now, I understand his, I understand both sides. All right, first of all, it seems like contradiction. Um, on the other hand, it's. I, I can understand the point that if you're going to say, yes, there should be separation of church and state, then you should be consistent about it. At the same time, I'm not sure that this is a church and state issue. It jeopardizes my ability to effectively govern. I mean, it's a church and it involves the state, but it's not that the it's not that it has anything to do with what the church is teaching. All right. It's simply the question of, is the government allowed to tax a church. Right. Normally, and in their paragraph there, it says this, the bits of so-called separation of church and state. What, you know, that is the, um, you know, this understanding that almost if it mentions God at all, it's automatically to be kicked out. You know, so there, there are certain things that cannot be done because, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's, well, and the idea of separation church and state was not to protect the state from the church. It was just the opposite. It was protect the church from the state. Right. And that's exactly what he's talking about is here we have a church that's being required to pay taxes, which, you know, the federal government does not charge taxes. It's a, you know, um, now I don't know. It'd be interesting to know, uh, cause it says they're, they're, um, charging churches, uh, charging, um, property owners on road work based on how much traffic they generate. So are they charging all nonprofit organizations? Or are they, are they charging, charging businesses? You know? Well, I mean, I imagine, I imagine businesses would be no problem, but nonprofits are also non-taxable. So are they charging the American Red Cross? Are they charging Planned Parenthood? Are they charging, uh, you know, just any other nonprofit, the, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or whatever, whatever nonprofit organization, uh, 501c3 organization you think of, nonprofit tax exempt organization. Right. Yeah. You know, be, you know, be, that's the problem because then we, isn't there an issue of, um, you know, what is non tax, what, what does tax exempt mean? Because it's just really a tax because they're saying it's a, Transportation utility fee. Yeah, you, they're calling it a fee instead of a tax, but it's a tax. <laughs> it's a fee charged by the government that's not to in order to provide a service except the roads which are provided anyway. So, um, it it's not that they're yeah so. So this really isn't a church state issue. This is a church nonprofit issue. I mean, yeah, if if there's if they're not charging the um, you know, the other nonprofits and they are charging the churches, well then that's a clear case of discrimination. All right. Um, you know, the other the other question of whether they can charge um this sort of tax to nonprofits that's a whole different issue. So, I, as I see it, the Alliance Defense Fund is going about this all wrong. At least, well, based on this one quote. All right, we—I uh, haven't seen the rest of their um, 
their article or their the rest of their um, platform or, or whatever you want to call it, their defense. And um, but you know this particular point about damaging the separation of church and state, I I don't see that. I you know okay uh, they the the article links back to the Kansas City Star in an article they have as the new fee shifts the burden for financing road work away from single family homes that may not generate a lot of traffic in other words it's part of property taxes uh, to properties such as big box stores churches and schools that generate more traffic and cause more wear and tear on city streets um, boy I'd love to see the Okay, so am I just the only one who sits here and says, okay, so you're charging the school? Where does the school get its money? Property taxes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but no, it doesn't do a problem here. Uh, and somehow or another, you're supposed to, uh, they have a calculation for how much property, how much traffic you generate. Um, and, um, um, you know, so far, uh, one place got a $4,000 reduction, um, in property saying they, they, that the square footage used to calculate the fee wasn't accurate. Uh, another one said, uh, 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 uh provided better traffic information for calculating the fee, uh, and got, uh, lowered theirs by uh, $1,900, but doesn't say how much it was to begin with. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, two churches, First Baptist and Pius X, St. Pius X, took the city to court over the fee. They say mission violated state law by imposing a tax disguised as a fee. Yeah. And they See, are non taxable entities according to, uh, Kansas state law. Uh, St. Pius, Pius was assessed $1,600. Seventeen hundred dollars, almost, and First Baptist was charged nine hundred. They paid half. Each of them have paid half the fee uh, that are, uh, you know, filing. Um, so in that case, I would uh, go to the point of saying, yeah, I think you know he is right in that here you have the state encroaching on the church and requiring a tax to be paid, but they're calling it a user fee just to get away from the idea that it's actually a tax. So they're being dishonest, disingenuous themselves. Right, right. I still don't see it as a church state issue. It's it's more of a state a non profit law issue. Which isn't the same thing. Because it applies to more than just churches. Right. Uh yeah, because schools are a non profit. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, this yeah, would also I, apply to you know, when you talk about schools, I, I can't imagine that they're taxing the public schools because that's sort of like, you know, you're putting it right back into your own pocket. Um, but, uh, I could see if that, like the, if there's some, uh, community college or, you know, something like that, a, a university community is, college run by the state. It's nonprofit. It's technically public. Oh, that's true. You know, so I don't know what they're charging. It just says private schools. schools. They, it doesn't know. say private, just says schools. Well, right. I know. So, but anyway, um, yeah, it, 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 I don't right. know. I think it's a it's a it's a bad decision. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily a. Uh, uh, and I, I think this person is making a mountain out of a molehill, trying to find a contradiction to what the guy's saying. Um, I mean, just just the way she writes here. Um, yeah, a legal alliance defending the right to hear and speak the truth. Their interpretation of Christianity. Through strategy, training, funding, and direct litigation, we defend our first liberty, religious freedom, read Freedom for Conservative Christians, by empowering our allies, recognizing that together we can accomplish far more than we can alone. Uh, the reality is, no, they have actually defended some liberal groups, too, and some Jewish groups and some other groups, too. Yep. Um, you know, it's not just strictly conservative Christianity, although, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, one of my favorite organizations, the FIRE, uh, uh, Freedom Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which fights really speech codes on college campuses. Well, it, it's funny, uh, uh, 
um, one of the lead people there, one of the lead people there works now for the AD, uh, uh, ADF. Um, another person, um, <laughs> heads up the group is uh, a member of the, um, ACLU. And, um, this one place called it a, 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 a right wing Republican organization. And this guy's like, I'm a, de- I'm a, you know, you know, uh, uh, Obama voting Democrat. What are you talking about? You know, and they said, well, why do you defend all these Christian groups and Republican groups on these campuses? Because they're the ones that get, you know, everybody's using the speech codes to try to shut them down. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, anyway. Well, do you think that they would uh, defend uh, these uh, structures in India? I don't know. I was actually thinking that we might go with the religious invocations in Hawaii, but let's go ahead. I I don't know anything about. Okay, I, I'm not even sure what's going on there, but oh gosh, it seems to be a problem that these people have got to deal with. This is this is you know when I first saw illegal religious structures spread through India, and I thought I thought. Why wouldn't they be allowed to build churches? It sounds like something that goes on in like Indonesia or something where you want to, people want to build churches and, um, and their, their building permit application just sits for years, you know, and, 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 and they refuse to, uh, to accept their application and, and things like that to prevent churches from being built. And, um, but this is, this is something a little bit different. All right. Um, this is, uh, Muslim mosques, uh, Hindu temples. It didn't mention anything about Christian churches, but that is, I wouldn't surprise me if that's happening. There's these buildings being put up all over the place. All right. And by buildings, we're not talking like, you know, huge, uh, structures, but, um, anything from, it, it, uh, well, it says most start small an illegal shrine may begin its life as a few ornaments and a candle in a tree. Then a bench is added. Then concrete floor is a roof and a sleeping alcove. Right. And so they, and then they just sort of get bigger and bigger. And like, it's, you know, I was talking about one that's, um, it's encroached on the sidewalk. You, you have to, you can't walk on the sidewalk because this thing is overlapping the sidewalk. All right, so they're not following building codes, and they're building them on public property. They're not buying property to build these things. They're just, you know, just imagine somebody going down to the local park and deciding to build a church there. <laughs> um, so, and the, the, this is popular because um, it says. Uh, People of India who are religious minded see gods in the stones in flower pots anywhere. I uh, said uh, a guy whose public interest filing in a Mumbai court led to the raising of 1,300 illegal structures. Unscrupulous people who don't want to work hard just put a sign up and people pray and give them money. Sometimes temples then turn into telecom shops. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is this is something that's going on in in India, and and it's a uh, it's just a, a really big problem that they've got these these churches and or not necessarily churches, but mosques and um, you know, thing and uh, temples and, and shrines and things like that that are going up all over the place. All right, well, it's uh, like fun. Um, yeah, most start small. Uh, an illegal shrine may begin its life as a few ornaments and a candle and a tree, then a bench is added, concrete floor, a, a roof, a sleeping alcove. Um, New Delhi's ancient Shiv Shakti Mokan Temple near Parliament is a good case in point. Uh, it started in 1968 as a birdhouse sized structure. Um, and now it's 20 by 60 feet with walls, columns, marble floors, twinkling lights, a sink, and life size statues in glass cases. Completely blocking the sidewalk. Each time city raises, workers try to raise it. Supporters quickly mobilize to fend them off. Alerted by a um, sub altern keeping watch twenty four seven. So just you know, it's like the opposite of a neighborhood watch. <laughs> <You're> yeah. Kind of, <laughs> like, oh, the city's coming in. They're going to try to knock down our our temple that's there illegally. Well, organize the mob. <laughs> To prevent him from doing it. 
Yeah. So. Oh, my favorite one is uh, they, 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 they tore down a mosque. Hey, this building's been here 50 to 100 years. Actually, it's only been there 11 years. They pick on Muslims more than Hindus. Yeah, well. <laughs> so. Yeah. Hey, hey, well, that's, that's, I mean, you know, uh, it's interesting because everyone's, well, we have these problems in America with, uh, you know, building codes and, you know, and, and, and zoning laws. Well, here's what happens when you don't have, when, when zoning laws are enforced properly. I got a bad feeling about this. You're breaking up. Breaking up is hard to do. <laughs> You're finding it remarkably easy. <laughs> um. So, so yeah, I don't know. It, it, this is this is the reason that you have to have building codes, you know, and and all this zoning and and all that kind of stuff because it can really get out of hand. And, and the sad thing here is that, um, like he points out, that a lot of this is just. Um, it's it's fake. It's it's just con men saying, "Well, I'll just you know put a birdhouse in a tree, and people will give me money. Hey, this works. I can make a living out of this. So my birdhouses only cost me money." So yeah. So uh, well, then we come up with to 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 um. um Hawaii. Now, okay. I, I read about this, and personally, I, I don't think it's that bad of an idea. Um, uh-huh. That um, the uh, Hawaii Senate is saying, let's just do without prayer. Um, apparently, they had a lot of different groups, you know, over the le- over the years, with prayer, and people have gotten offended for it. They got a uh, complaint from the American Civil Liberties Union. Wow, where we heard about them tonight. <laughs> uh, you know, that, you know, some of the prayers were decidedly Christian, uh, referencing Jesus. Oh, you know, bad, bad, bad people there. Um, you know, and, uh, um, and they, uh, and so they, you know, uh, 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 and instead of saying, okay, Instead of saying prayers to hey you up there wherever you might happen to be, um, in the name of whatever God it is that you may or may not believe in, um, then just just do without the prayer entirely. Yeah, we're not going to censor or neuter people, um, you know, whether whoever they're pray, you know, whoever leads the prayer, we're not going to censor or neuter them. Let's just let's just just do without it. It's less problem. It's less hassle. Yeah, well, that's kind of the debate because the. Um... There was they put together a three member committee to look into it, and the committee says recommended allowing invocations as long as they're non sectarian in nature, uh, avoiding references to particular political questions, sidestep mention of deities or central figures of pretty particular religions. So you know the god of our own understanding. <laughs> yeah, hey you. <laughs> I mean, I remember reading this. You know, George Will was complaining about, you know, um, you know, the, the, the air thing. And he I remember there was, uh, he pointed to a, a, the invocation of a woman rabbi at a, I can't remember if it's, I think it was a secular university I think, or a high school in Rhode Island. It was one of the other. I mean, it was, you know, you know, gosh, I, th- I think there's more theology in the old song "Spirit in the Sky." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it was it was so bland. It was offensive in the fact that you know it was you know whoever, whatever. You know, maybe I found more depth in the in the in the Native American guy. You know, at the Tucson uh, uh, event. <laughs> <laughs> like Father Sky and Mother Earth, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, something, but uh, but you know, whatever it was all about, it was you know. But I mean, so you know, I, I'm just kind of you know, if you're going to you know try to, I, I'm with the guys who say rather than neuter them, let's just dump the whole tradition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, what's the point of calling in a Christian pastor? To say a prayer, 
but not say a Christian prayer. Right. Sorry, anybody could do that. And and having the, him there, it's it's like, here we're gonna we want you to come in and speak, but we're going to gag you first. <laughs> you know. Right. So yeah, wow. either either allow. You know, sort of anybody from any background to come in and just take turns. Let people know where they're coming from beforehand so they can choose to, if they choose to bow their heads because they believe in the same God mm-hmm. or they choose to just sort of sit quietly and not bother whoever else, fine. Or else just get rid of it altogether. I I continue to wonder why, um, why they have those things. It's a sort of a product of a bygone era. Right. Well, now myself, I I, I think uh, I don't see there a problem. I think it's a very nice tradition to ask different religious leaders to come in. Yeah, you know, you know I, I I I took part in the uh, dedication religious dedication of a, a veteran cemetery. Out in Western Massachusetts, and that's what we were told. Each of us has five minutes. Do your thing. We, you know, we want every religion we can get involved. There's no restrictions on any of you. Um, and uh, there, there's no general invocation or anything uh, other than the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, you know, like I've said before, you know, uh, the, the, the Catholic guy read the uh, collect for the dedication of a cemetery. Uh, the Presbyterian guy had everybody join singing um, the Navy hymn. Um, one guy read the Declaration. I uh, know read that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and I shared the gospel. Yeah, you know, but it was open to anybody who wanted to come. You know, any any you know religious you know pastor or rabbi or imam or whatever. You get your five minutes. Well, it seems kind of goofy to have an invocation, but not actually invoke God's name. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, it seems weird that you're going to ask a, uh, a, a, a Christian pastor or a uh, uh, is or or, or um, a Muslim imam or a Jewish rabbi or uh, whatever a universal Unitarian Universalist is uh, called her leaders, I think they call them pastors, I'm not sure, but whatever it is, to ask this person to come in and then, oh, by the way, um, whatever faith it is you represent, neuter the whole thing and just, you know, say, hey, you, y'all up there, uh, spirit in the sky. Um, Grand architect of the universe. You know, oh, wait, that's sectarian. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you know, they should just use uh, the the AA God of our own understanding. Yeah, you know, the uh, or whatever whatever you you're trying to you know deal with. Uh, oh, I know, Great Spirit of Stovacor. Um, uh, how do I can Stovacor? Yeah, the Great Spirit of Stovacor. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think. Remember who who Cybox God was and what the planet's name was. He 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 was going to. Shakir or whatever it was there in the middle of the the uh, uh, universe in Star Trek V. But. Oh, oh, all right, <laughs> all right. Um, I wonder if you went in and had a great prayer to Surak, <laughs> God of the Vulcans. See, see, really invoking Star Trek V is just not a good idea. Man. We're all trying to forget that that existed. Thank you. I'm gonna have nightmares tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the god of Avatar, oh. <laughs> oh, the 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 life tree or whatever. Okay. Grandma Oak Tree from uh, the, um um uh, uh, Pocahontas. Yeah. See, so, yeah, I. But the thing is, that, you know, if you're gonna allow people from any religion, then our our Jedi friends will have to come and invoke the Force. The Force is strong with this one. The so. force be with you, and also with you. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, um, last story tonight is, I don't know, a good transition. What do you do with any dealers? <laughs> Just, you know, it's kind of there. <laughs> um, 
anyway, uh, 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 Pope Benedict XVI um, called for has called for effective pastoral action to break the vicious circle begun when Christian couples are allowed to marry without adequate preparation and knowledge of the sacraments requirements. Um, he says, no one has the right to a marriage ceremony. The right to marriage in canon law always refers only to the right to celebrate an authentic marriage. Right. Um, I, you know, I read this article and I thought it was a um, nicely done, nice pastoral word. Yeah. Yeah. A little, uh, little heavy on the, you know, juridical bond and, you know, all that kind of church language. Um, uh huh. Yeah. But besides that, you know, he says, uh, with the various means available for careful preparation and verification, it's possible to develop effective pastoral activities aimed at avoiding the nullification of marriages. Uh, every other- In other words, we've got too many Catholics getting divorced. We need to be, <laughs> we need to, you know, good pre marriage preparation. Right, right. Because of how many, I, I mean, I know a lot of, of Roman Catholics that. They got divorced, and then and then you have to pay the annulment fee, and mm-hmm. uh, and so I know. Let's see, I know some Lutherans that used to be Catholic. They refused to pay the annulment fee because they said this is ridiculous. Why should I have to pay money? You know, and that somehow you know makes it okay or something, and um, and so they became Lutheran. <laughs> But uh, and, and I know other just lapsed Catholics because they refuse to pay the annulment fee. Right. Well, one of the problems I I think you know that that um, takes place in Catholic churches is that you know they 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 have their Cana classes, um, you know, which are the pre-marriage. But the fact that they're classes, they really don't sit down and do things one on one very often. It's done in groups, uh-huh. and I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I just see group. Pre-marriage counseling less effective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do like, you know, sort of marriage encounter weekend thing or, you know, something like that with couples that are already married, fine. But if you're going to have, um, if you're actually going to talk to couples, kind of see where they're at and um, see sort of where where the lacking is as far as their expectations and, and things like that. Um, you know, that you can really only do that one on or two on one. So because of, you know, so many of the problems in marriages are from, uh, just bad expectations. You know, they go in all kind of starry eyed and, and then things don't turn out exactly the way they wanted it to turn out. And, um, and then all of a sudden, oh, well, this is work, right? Well, that's not always the case. You know, I don't want to overgeneralize that too much. Uh, you know, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, things, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, the one thing I, I always warn people about is, you know, realizing that the person you're falling in love with today is not the person you'll be married to 10 years from now. Right. You're going to change and they're going to change. And, you know, it's and that's a realization. And and some of those changes really are some of those are beautiful changes. Uh, some of them can be ugly changes. You know, I remember one couple and the guy uh, was in his uh, 20s and went through a severe depression. And, you know, I mean, it was just. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I remember talking to him, like, how do you, how do you, you know, talking to his wife, how do you deal with this? Just, just, she's like, oh, he's not the person I married at all. You know, I didn't, you know, he said, you wouldn't believe him. He was happy. He was funny. He was always laughing. He was always smiling. And now he just never wants to get out of bed. And, you know, and, you know, that takes a lot to deal with that. Mm-hmm. You make me sad. So be it. Right. But, and then you hit 15, you begin to get old, and then life really sucks. But that's another story. <laughs> but, you know, you just, what I emphasize to couples is there's no third option, right? When things aren't going the way that you want them to, uh, especially if it's a some sort of a conflict, um, then you either work it out or you decide to spend the rest of your lives miserable. I recommend the former. 
but there's no third option. Divorce is not the third option. Now, sometimes when you have a situation like depression or something like that, um, you still need to to work it out. But sometimes working it out means getting some, you know, getting some counseling, getting, you know, sometimes medicational help. Sometimes it's a matter of the spouse getting counseling on coming up with some sort of coping mechanism, you know, to, to deal with the changes in their spouse. But you're still there for them because they still need you more than ever. <laughs> I think I need a hug. And and marriage is is really more about what you can do for the other person, not about what you get out of it. See, Billy Idol gets it. I don't know why she doesn't get it. And because that's what love is. That's the love that God showed us. You know, Jesus didn't come for us to uh, because you know of what he could get out of it. I mean, in a sense, because he wanted to spend the rest of eternity with us. Okay. But, um, but why? Cause he loves us because he wants us to have the best. And, um, so you, you have to go into a marriage that way. But when you have, when you have that in a marriage, it's a beautiful thing. And it helps you deal with the, the tough times when they come. Oh, very nice, Blaine. Marriage is really messed up in our society. Really? I had no <laughs> But it has been for a long time. I mean, right. you know, I mean, all the, I, I see this over and over, um, sort of bring this full circle, um, where the, uh, people point out that a lot of the sort of family values senators and and stuff like that, that are um, openly speaking out against gay marriage and things like that are, have had multiple marriages. (laughs) Like uh, whatever happened to family values, that's kind of hypocritical and it is right. Um, They believe in family values as long as it's your family, not mine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, but you know, we all need to work on, on being more loving. You know, mm-hmm. I, I talked at the beginning about being more loving to, to the needy around us. All right. But we need to work on being more loving toward our spouses, toward our kids, you know, and, and by being more loving, I don't mean like feeling more affection. All right. Um, that's not really something you can control. All right. Well, as I was telling my, as I often tell my Bible class, uh, my, my my couples in pre-marriage counseling, love is what gets you through when you don't like each other very much. Yeah, you know because it, you know it's it was interesting because I um uh one of our one of the pastors up here was talking to a uh, Hindu guy from India about how how do they make it with these arranged marriages that you know still a lot of Indian marriages are arranged. Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, how do you guys do this? And he says, oh, he says, well, you guys talk about love. And marriage is about love. We say that marriage is about commitment. And it doesn't really worry about how you feel about the other person, but you're committed to the, to being married to the person. Right. Which is really what love is. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we tend to think of it being nice feelings. Right. So nope. Feelings change from moment to moment. That it does. So, anyway, maybe you guys have, maybe the listeners have different viewpoints on marriage or any other thing you we could think of. Maybe you think Dale's a raving liberal. He's definitely getting there. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> He has really loosened up in the years I've known him, I tell you. Uh, you can talk to, you can give us your feedback at CrossFeed News, uh, a podcast at CrossFeedNews.com. Yep. And um, so there won't be a show next week because we'll all be watching the Packers beat the Steelers. And you will be happy to know I will be, you know, fighting and cheering on the meat Packers, you know. Uh, and all. Wise man. Wise man. Well, you know, you know, it's, Hey, what can you say? Meat Packers versus Steelers. Two failed industries. 
<laughs> if, they, if they're really going to be realistic, they'd all be Chinese players. Yeah, Jim's even going to wear green and gold um, in in church next week. Hmm, why change the white? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so um, but no, we 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 um, I um, the Steelers did their job. They 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 beat the Jets, so we were we were happy. Now at this point, we don't really care. So um, but we don't want the return to the terrible towels or to the Iron Curtain, or to any of those horrible things from the 1970s. If it's the Steelers win, next thing you know, it'll be Disco. We'll be back, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will see the return to, you know, John Travolta and the Bee Gees, you know, for be the, doing the halftime show, and, you know. Hey, and... it would probably be better than the Who's halftime show. <laughs> Now, who's doing halftime this year? Uh, Black Eyed Peas. Oh, okay. Which I'm not a big fan of the Black Eyed Peas, but after seeing Bruce Springsteen and the Who, and you know when they really are were sort of doing their version of Brett Favre, <laughs> should have hung it up a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. After after um, um, Justin Timberlake and um, Janet Jackson. We, you know, had these, you know, years of the, um, um, uh, um, oldie but goodies, Paul McCartney, The Who, Bruce Springsteen, I can't remember who all else, you know, whose, whose last new song was, you know, before the players were even born. So it's, <laughs> but you know, no. My favorite today, to date, of course, was uh, I remember way back when, when Fox used to have a, uh, um, uh, a show on for the 15 minutes of halftime. And I remember, you know, turning to that and watching that for the 15 minutes of halftime, then telling, right. okay, halftime's over, get back to the game. Oh, yeah, where they have like The Simpsons or something like that. Yeah, yeah, a little 15 minute episode. It was cool all those days. But they're showing the game now, so they got to show the stupid halftime show. So time to go get some chili. Anyway, so we will see you all in two weeks, which we also the week of the dedication of our new organ at our church. So, cool. And, and so uh, we will see you and ask God's blessings upon you in the between in the meantime. Good night, everybody. God bless. You.